Greetings and welcome to Flanagan's Ecologic. I am your host, Ted Flanagan, and joined again by Tucker Perkins, the president and CEO of the Propane Education and Research Council. He also has a podcast called The Path to Zero. Uh, he was a guest of ours in January of 2023. He's got a new book, and we're going to be talking about his new book and some of his latest perspectives on why propane is important in the transition to a carbon-free future. Hey, Tucker, welcome back to the Flanagan's Ecologic. It's really good to see you again. Ted, it is wonderful to be back, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Very good, very good. Well, it's going to be short and sweet, and you've got a new book out, so we want to talk all about the new book. Uh, it sounds like you are, you've taken a number of episodes of your podcast, a number of your guests. You've got now, you said, you've got 103 podcast episodes, and you've taken some of the most influential conversations and put them into a book. Is that correct? Yeah, Ted, you know, as we, as we kept working through the podcast, we kept realizing that maybe we were having a discussion with our guests that I didn't see when I read the papers and didn't see when I, you know, watch the news at night. And we really wanted to tell the story about how we really do have the ability to get to path to zero, how important it is to listen to the innovators. Um, and you really just try to tell the story about what I would say, hopeful uh, optimism around getting to zero carbon and, and the importance of sound innovation and, and follow through. So it, that, that was the genesis of it. And I think we really struggled sometimes to limit it to 12 conversations. I'm but sure. It, it, it all came together nicely. Yeah. And I've already introduced you as the, you know, the head of the Propane Education and Research Council. And we, in our last podcast, we talked all about the benefits of propane. But certainly one thing that strikes me about you, Tucker, is that you're very articulate about our goal the, and the goal of getting to, to zero carbon in our energy infrastructure. But the practicality of in this transition, not forgetting about some of the most important, important aspects, it's got to be affordable. It's got to be equitable. It can't just be a, a, a passionate plea to electrify everything at all cost because that just doesn't work for everybody. And we see it. We see it in real time right now. You know, I find it interesting that people are surprised about this pushback now against electric vehicles. And I don't know that it is a pushback. It is the natural cycle of things. The early adopters will buy anything, right? I mean, they, it sounds different and better. I'll try it. That that only gets you a small subset of the population, and and now we're in that spot where we're moving from early adopters to the early majority, and it's a it's it's a difficult move. So yeah, I I am optimistic, uh, and I'm really happy to see some of the innovations that we've been working on, see the speed of which things are changing, but I still am the first to say that. So much of what we're doing is still shiny bullets and, you know, something so far in the future that it may or may not really impact our climate in time, for sure. Right, right. And, um, you know, this whole notion of electrify everything, I guess uh, you would say that's an easy thing to say. But, but in fact, uh, that's, that, that would bankrupt us, right? Or that would be very, very inequitable to a large swath of the population. That, that, that there, are, there are bona fide uses of uh, propane in particular that, that will be important for this transition. Yeah, so I would, I would say both of the things you said, that electricity would become very expensive under that scenario. And, and it is, in fact the least equitable of all the forms of energy for the people who are impacted the most. But I would also say when the, when the, when the bogey is the climate and reducing our greenhouse gases, yeah. that it's certainly not the best path. I mean, we, you and I both know it's not the best path when we're sitting relying on electricity and we lose it to a hurricane or a tornado or to a thunderstorm. But, you know, I think I can demonstrate now with great confidence that it's also not best for the environment um, as we think about all the ways we use electricity. And for, for anyone to say that that is the path, that then the only path to a clean climate is through electrifying everything, I think I can say with total certainty now that that's not right. 
Now, Ted, one day maybe we'll talk about nuclear fusion, and then I think that's a game changer, right? That's that that's a completely mm -hmm. different conversation. But as we sit here today, nuclear fusion is a long ways off. Do you do you see? I, th I think I think you've said that you think it is. A, a, there's a strong possibility that we will reach a net zero emissions by by 2050. And so I think the oper operative word there is, is net. So I think you're saying we would still have some use of carbon-based fuels of resources, but they, they, there would be offsets. Is that, I mean, it's short of Absolutely. nuclear fusion. Absolutely. And then what I, what I say all the time is we can reach it, that net zero is possible. And it's interesting as the book, you know, begins to get a little bit more widespread use and people call me that, you know, can talk with me openly they'll say you know gosh the notion of net zero seems ridiculous to me but i think we clearly believe after studying it for years and years that net zero is possible but to suggest that you're going to get there with just solar and wind and geothermal and maybe nuclear power or hydro it's just hmm. it's not going to be it's not going to be the way we do it talk about i i listened to a little bit of one of your discussions about the new york city a uh, fleet of vehicles. And uh, it sounds as though New York City has very aggressive goals for electrifying all their light duty vehicles by 2035 and the heavy duty vehicles by 2040, if not before. Is propane now a, a part of that transition there? No, that, and that's a good example sometimes where I talk to people who I don't believe he will be using propane anytime soon. Because as you correctly state, their goal is to electrify. And they don't see hydrogen as a solution. They don't see natural gas as a solution. They see electrification as their solution. But I would tell you, one, they're not very concerned about what things cost right now. Two, you know, they're relatively small geography with a lot of idling. So it does tend to lead itself to stop and start operations but they're not focusing necessarily on some of the hard to electrify solutions, garbage trucks, snow plows, uh, fire engines. I'm quite confident that before he retires in his current job, he'll be using hybrid vehicles that are using electric motors, but also using an internal combustion engine, probably using renewable fuels, maybe maybe renew renewable diesel, maybe renewable natural gas, and probably renewable propane. Um, for some of those hard to electrify solutions like snow plows and fire engines and perhaps street sweepers. And so you would, you would say that this uh, New York's path in this case is, is the narrow path. I don't think you use that term, but I'm, you, 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 have, you have discussed in your book about the wider path, right? And the wider path, yeah, I, go ahead. I would say that New York it has a very clear view and they're going to execute on that clear view and it may be appropriate for new york now now the truth is even new york's got to realize they have a real problem with enough electrons right and and if you listen to that podcast uh all the way through you'll hear him say at one time there are times we have to decide whether we're going to electrify uh a station to charge our vehicles or we're going to allow the building next door to electrify to move to better heat or better lighting or whatever. It's, it was almost an either or choice because the electric grid is already starved for appropriate electricity. But I would say at least New York City is an example of they've got a plan and they're using it. Now, I'm quick to say I think the plan in Hawaii is quite different than the plan for Maine, to your point earlier, and that you know, we'll see a lot more wind and solar in Hawaii than we will in probably Maine. So, but, but done properly, at least from our analysis, it does involve electricity, but it certainly involves low carbon fuels today and zero carbon fuels in the future, like propane for transportation, for power gen, for things that you and I routinely don't talk about using low carbon fuels like propane for. And, and by the way, I'm seeing it in real time play out right now. Meaning, meaning what? Meaning we're seeing both uh, fleet after fleet coming to us and that had said, look, I'm going to become electrified. Now they're coming to us and saying, look, I can't afford it. 
I can't, uh, my duty cycle doesn't work for this. The impact on my payload doesn't work for me. So let's rethink using propane today, renewable propane. Power gen, you know, everybody thinks about their propane generator at their home, their, their backup, you know, Generac or Kohler. But now yeah. we're seeing a lot of medium, do, uh, you know, me medium-sized commercial opportunities as well as industrial opportunities they need power and it's just not available from the grid. So we're, we're seeing it on in every aspect uh, yeah. that people are rethinking how to use low carbon fuels like propane or natural gas. I was uh, interested to review the benefits of your, our last conversation and you know, that, that propane is, is easy to store and, and storage is such a big issue now with all of our, our concerns about energy resilience or reliable power, no methane in, in propane, very low socks and knocks, uh, extremely low particulate matter. But, but I think a, a big theme of yours, uh, Tucker, is that it's, it's also affordable. And that this is, you know, there's an awful lot of propane that's being used uh, off of the natural gas main lines in rural America. You said something like 75% of, of all Americans are, are touched by propane. It's, it's a little bit behind the scenes, but it's, it's, it's widespread. I think the question I routinely get is, I understand that propane powers my grill, but how is it going to change the environment in which I live? How is it going to radically improve not only my life, but the environment in which my children and I live? And I'm, I'm really happy to see we're, we're beginning to see it unfold in front of us. And I, I love that you called out all those attributes the last attribute that you did mention, but I think it will too become quite prominent is as we think about energy security, not just having enough energy, but do we, do we have the resources in front of us? And we, you know, it's front and center every day as we think about batteries, right? Bat battery materials, battery technology. It's not really in the American wheelhouse right now. In fact, it's not even in the wheelhouse of countries that are friendly to America. Propane, on the other hand, and natural gas, we're, we're completely linked here. You know, we're, it's a domestic thing. Uh, we produce the most propane by far of anybody in the world. We also use the most propane of anybody in the world by far, but the ability to have that, as you say, methane free, affordable, plentiful, which is nice, but domestic resource that then is positively impacting to your point, greenhouse gases, uh, NOx, SOx, particulate matter. So we're really benefiting not only our climate, but our health. It's a pretty potent set of uh, attributes. Yeah, a piece, of the, a piece of the puzzle, right? A piece of the solutions, and especially when you're offsetting diesel, right? Or, and, and gasoline, right? When you can, when you can replace that with propane, you've, you've taken a huge step, a huge bite out of the carbon footprint. And, and certain people get mad at me sometimes because I'm such so hard on diesel. Um, but, you know, I'm quick to say I think diesel is the next coal, right? I think, you know, we often talk about let's make this diesel's last decade. And, it, and that's probably a bit impossible. I mean, we use about 60 billion gallons of diesel fuel a year in the United States. Um, you know, I come to you to get... To get to this today, I got to come through a construction site and I'm looking, you know, at all the diesel being consumed there. But yes, if we could use propane in lieu of diesel in your town specifically, I could say if we could get rid of diesel in the ports, get rid of diesel in the vehicles that already could be operating on propane. Let me tell you, your children would be free of asthma. Your skies would be clearer. By the way, the streets are quieter. And for every fleet we're working to right right now, we cut their costs in half. Yeah, so, no, I did I did misspeak though, didn't I? Because you're not reducing the, the CO two uh, output, right? If you switch from diesel to propane, it's got all no, these we other benefits. Can trim. So that is that is CO two is one of the better attributes of a diesel engine. They're relatively low in CO two, but by moving to propane. You don't you don't increase the CO two. Right. In fact, there are next gen engines that are already just starting to get into the market 
in many cases, will cut CO2 by 10 or 15 percent. We need to go to renewable fuels to really make the difference there. To really, to and, dr really drive and, that down. And that technology, even since you and I last talked, that whole technology is just spinning on its head. It's, it's fascinating to watch how we can get to not only more affordable renewable fuels, but uh, higher volumes of them. Hey, let's, let's jump back to the book, because uh, I really wanted to hear more about some of the conversations that you were struck by. Can you, can you uh, give, me, give me a couple of them and, and, and give me a little color around them? Well, I mean, they're all so important, and by the way, probably as many as we didn't mention in the book were equally important, but I, I always love to start with Meredith Angwin. Meredith Angwin, to me, is the dean of the electric grid, a great career, you know, with electric utilities and the research agencies. But she's really kind of been the beacon of light for me around nuclear power, uh, to a degree geothermal power even, which isn't nuclear, I understand, but, you know, about where electricity is going to go. And she's, she is quite clear. She thinks about the fragility of the grid and how to mm. insinuate that this, we're going to get to the world we need by just using solar and wind. It, it's maybe not laughable because it's not really funny, but it's, it's just misguided by itself. And she's the one who just recently I was talking to her about what is the true future of fusion? And without hesitation, she said, never. Really? And, you know, I, I understand that response because I think what she means is far, far away. I, I would love to not think the answer to that's never because all of a sudden now we really do have a, powerful, affordable, environmentally friendly energy source. But Meredith Angwin doing two things, talking about the necessity of using nuclear power in all flavors, by the way, fission like we do it today, small scale modular, um, citing them in places we've never thought about before. Meredith Angwin is, to me, kind of a beacon of truth as we think about mm -hmm. how the electric grid uh, transfers and transforms. Interesting. Well, you know, I, I got to say, I, I'm, I'm still not in the nuclear camp in any form, but I've, I've certainly heard a lot of very rational arguments that, that we need yeah. all forms of power. Let's how about another, how about another, uh, another conversation? The other one. And, and again, these were early on in the podcast, but they were so meaningful as we thought about it was Scott Tinker. And at hmm. the time, Scott Tinker, um, was the head of the Bureau of Economic Geology for the state of Texas. Um, but he really was one of the first guys to think about energy on a global scale and really talk about it more from a geologist perspective and min minerals, mineral mining. How are we going to get to this world? How, thinking through batteries and battery energy storage through batteries and to a degree thinking through emissions in the atmosphere. I mean, his famous saying to me that was so important as we're watching New York wrestle with some, what they're going to do or California wrestle with what they're going to do, yet China is in this place and, you know, other countries are in their place. He, he said, I'll never forget it when he said it, the earth has one atmosphere and a very efficient conveyor belt, um, meaning it really does matter how well China cleans their air, how well Europe cleans their air, for that matter, how well North America does the same. But, you know, Scott was the guy that's really open about the complexities of mining and then uh, turning mine to material into something that's valuable. Mm. And, and how dangerous it was right now that most of those interests were then and still are now controlled really by Chinese interests. You know, I think about the climate issue and I and carbon emissions. I'm always thinking, you know, you got electricity, the electric sector, and that, you know, obviously the electricity sector is getting cleaned up radically. You've talked a little bit about it and how we're going to practically practically get there. Mobility, we've talked a little bit about EVs and and you you take a shot at Tesla in that gosh, those are really just for the for the for the rich people, right? You got an expensive expensive car but completely not affordable, not accessible for, for many, many people. So you've just, you've got this downturn. And, and then I'm thinking about buildings and industry and, and um, that's always to, to me seemed like the hardest thing to decarbonize is, 
is buildings and industry. How did how do some of your some of the people that were in your podcast or how, how are they reacting to that sector or that use? I think to this day, most of the people I'm talking with still find electricity not the likely solution for building heat. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, it's it's a materially different answer when you're in San Diego, where heat is not quite as valuable as cooling. But mm-hmm. let's go to Boston or New York or, you know, so many places. But most of the people that I have talked with still see a real value and low carbon fuels today, like propane, being the fuel that makes your buildings warm and heats water when it's cold. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think where we've come with uh, efficiencies of boilers and, and uh, now we talk about modern combined heat and power. So these are boilers that capture the waste heat, produce power from that. And I think those are real world examples where it's really the only way you can efficiently operate your university. Let's just start there um, and, and operate a, a, ser- a gym uh, where you have a huge demand for hot water. Uh, you're not going to do it efficiently with electricity. You just couldn't if you had enough electricity and the electricity was cheap enough. And we're, we're seeing it today, Ted, as we, again, in real time, as we try to understand how to deal even with the gener- what the power generation needs for data centers. Where does that incremental, forget baseload power, where does that incremental power come from? And we see it every day. It's not coming from solar and wind. It's coming from the dirtiest sources like coal and oil. And hmm. so, you know, if you look at the data that we're seeing come off the grid right now, the grid was getting cleaner. But now all of a sudden the growth engine popped back up and the grid got dirtier in 23 in terms of greenhouse gas outputs because we needed something to fill the gap for power gen and we chose more coal and more oil. Hmm. And, and back to the buildings just for a second. You're saying that in order to heat a, a building or a gymnasium at a, a university to provide the domestic hot water, you know, that's going to be a very, very expensive proposition using heat pumps, using electric heat pumps, right? And that I, th- I think what you would say is, let's deprioritize that. That is, not, you know, that is not an appropriate use or an affordable use of electricity, right? So let's, go, let's, make, let's shift that thinking, let's shift our thinking around that instead of this sort of herd-like mentality to all electric, let's think about going towards low carbon fuels in that, in that particular application saving a lot of money, and then that money can actually be spent in, in other higher priority areas. Absolutely. And let, let's talk about a heat pump just for a moment, because we have actually debuting right now a heat pump, so a conventional heat pump, but instead of having electric resistance coils for those ultra cold days, we actually have a hybrid system. So there we use propane hot water that blows across the coils. So it's a good example of a hybrid system taking the best of electricity when it's marginally cold or for air conditioning when it's warm. But on those cold days, when the utility doesn't really want to provide power, when you really want to have a comfortable energy source, now you have the best of both worlds. Not unlike a hybrid vehicle. And I I would tell you Mm. that as we get closer and closer to the reality here, we're seeing a lot of those hybrid solutions check all the boxes right and uh, the micro the microgrids that my company's involved with uh, you know if you want 100 percent reliability on your microgrid for x number x duration you know the supplying it's like a tertiary sewage treatment plant supplying that last five percent to get to 100 percent is so ridiculously expensive that you know we've seen backup generators being used fossil fuel based generators in those yeah. applications yeah but, I, as i travel around and look I'm horrified, there's no other word to say it sometimes, at the amount of these large diesel gen sets that just crank on on those ultra cold days or providing power when the power's out. That That's just 1970s technology to me. And we, we just have better ways to do it now. How are you, um, I'm shifting around a little bit, but uh, how, how are you 
What kind of offsets do you envision? I mean, let's just assume that we're not going to get to a fusion future where where energy is too cheap to meter, um, and that we'll still be we'll still be requiring offsets to get to this net zero emission, say by twenty fifty. What offsets do you do you envision? Is it tree planting? Is it sequestration? What, what are you What are you thinking? Well, the first offset we're really excited about is finding ways to capture methane that's not currently being captured today and reusing CO2 that's being captured and convert it straight to renewable propane. I'm really excited about that technology. And we're now in partnership with Department of Energy on a couple of projects and a couple of leading universities in the U.S. and then a couple outside of the U.S. as we, as we see ways to use electrochemistry to directly convert CO2 or methane that previously were just going to escape into the air to repurpose them into renewable propane. So we're really excited about those sources, but we, we do see we're, we're, we're deep into trying to think through carbon capture in a different way, because again, you would believe we, we need to capture the carbon that we've emitted uh, and then repurpose it if we're really going to get to a true net zero. Are you, are you, do you have, do you hold much promise for the carbon sequestration, you know, air to air, air capture of carbon? Is in direct air capture, true doubt. Yeah, um, yeah it's expensive stuff, know, I guess, at this point, right? Yeah, no, I, um, you know, at least everywhere I read, I don't, and I, I, I fully understand pumps and filters and all those things. <laughs> but again, you look at the energy consumed yeah. for the benefit created. The math doesn't quite equate to me yet, but I see smart companies, um, Occidental, you know, leading that list that I think they think they can do it. So I'm, I'm always hopeful yeah. for innovation. And by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm a living proof that things that you're studying in the lab all of a sudden have a massive change for the worse. So you throw it away or something happens that you didn't quite understand for the better. And that's where we are with some of this electrochemical shifts of CO2 to propane. It, all of a sudden we read, and I'm talking about processes that are commercially viable and really affordable. You know, I think, I think we, we have always had two feet on the ground for affordability because we see it every day that our consumers won't pay much more for an environmentally superior product. No matter what they say, when, the, when it really comes down to voting with your wallet, you have to be in bounds. Uh, they have to be able to touch that value created because they won't pay a tremendous premium for an environmentally beneficial product. Right. Yeah. And, and as you've described and, and articulated so well, there, there's a moral certitude that that we should go all electric, whereas the scientific facts and the I think you'd say the economic realities are that there needs to be more thinking along those lines. I wanted to just ask you one more question about the book and and you know you interview this is based on twelve different interviews you've done. The book is called The Path to Zero. What would your authors, if we had them all in the same room, what what would they say the biggest challenge is as, as we are on this on this wide path to zero? Oh, I don't think there's any question that they would all quickly agree <laughs> that once they get beyond their own technology, it's about human factors and having people accept doing something different. Right. I see it. We, I, I see it every day. You can have the best solution. Um it can be positive for you, positive for the environment, perhaps uh, economical, but it's not the way you did it 10 years. It's not the way your father did it. And so there's just this general reluctance to change. And I think that's, that is quite certainly uh, the biggest barrier we have to adoption is our own. We, we get in our own way too much uh, and we're not willing to make that change. Well, and then you're and this takes us right back to what you do professionally, which is to educate, 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 just the steady drumbeat of raising, raising awareness one, one mind at a time. 25 years ago, when we created 
this Propane Education and Research Council, there was no thought given to talking to our own industry or talking to consumers about how to use these new technologies. It was, we'll create these technologies, we'll educate plumbers or architects or engineers, we'll not need to, to convince the final end users. And what we see today, yeah. we, we need to spend almost uh, an extra dose of time <laughs> with yeah. the end users, whether it be fleet managers or building owners or homeowners, because this whole different way of doing things it really is tough for us as humans and individuals. Yeah, it really is true. It really is true. Well, thank you so much for what you're doing, educating me, educating our listeners, uh, educating your listeners as well on this path to zero. I think you raise so many, so many good points, uh, value, value, valuable points about, about making priorities, about make, making sure that this tent that we're, this tent that we're putting around us is uh, is open to all and uh, accessible to all. Well, I love talking with you. I, I I know what you do in your day work, and I mean that's so important. But you know, you're you're one of the longer running podcasters, you know, in in the history of podcasting, and it's kind of easy to see why. So I I appreciate the conversations, and I look forward to having more. I do too. So great to see you. Thanks so much. That's it. Thanks for listening to Flanagan's Ecologic. We'll see you next time.